Computing 2, An Introduction to Programming, Part 3 Algorithms The definition of an algorithm in Wikipedia is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. Now, I also defined it in the previous lecture as a complete and precise set of steps that will solve a problem and achieve an identical result whenever given the same set of data to a defined level of accuracy. And I made that slightly different definition because of the possibility of using things like random numbers. So, ordered steps, repeatable and known or defined accuracy. Suppose then we wish to count the number of amino acids in a PDB file. So remember, PDB, protein data bank files, contain structural information about proteins. Now a simple thing to do if we look at a structure of a peptide like this is to calculate the number of C-alpha, C-A atoms in the protein. Because N-C-alpha, C-O, this is the repeating backbone of the protein. So we will always have the CA positions. We might not have some of the side chain positions, for example, because they may be missing and not visible in the electron density that we're looking at in an X-ray crystallography map. Here's a short sample from a PDB file. So what we're going to look for then is these CA records here, 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 and count how many of these occur. So this third column is the atom type, NC-alpha-CO, and then the side chain, NC-alpha-CO side chain. Here then is a flowchart that would do what we need. We start at the top and we set res count, some variable in which go we're going to store the number of residues to zero. We read a line from the PDB file and we test whether we've got to the end of the file. We haven't, we're at the start of the file, so we test whether the atom is a CA. If it isn't, then we carry on round, we read another line and we keep looping round like this until we do find a CA. Once we've found a CA, then we increment this variable res count, loop back round and read another line. So this will keep looping round here every time we don't have a CA. Every time we do, then we'll increment the residue count and carry on until we get to the end of the file when we can display the result. This is another representation of the same thing, this time as pseudocode. So pseudocode is not real code. A computer won't understand it. It's really just another way of representing a flowchart. So here we're setting the residue count to zero. We're starting a loop, reading a line from the file. If it's the end of the file, we will display the res count result and exit. If it isn't, then we test if it's a CA, and if it is, we increment residue count. And then we go to the loop and carry on looping. Now, I said I was going to show you Perl as an example, because I think most of you will have had some experience with Python, so it's good to introduce another popular language. As I said earlier, Perl is a general-purpose, interpreted, just-in-time compiled procedural language. Perl stands for Practical Extraction and Reporting Language, and it borrows from another, uh, a number of other languages. Why, then, do I like Perl rather than Python? Well, first of all, you can read files without opening them. So, in Python, you have to have an explicit open statement, whereas in Perl you can just start reading a file which either comes from a pipe or is named on the command line. Doing that in 
Python and having that flexibility to deal with either something named on the command line or that's come out of another program is actually quite difficult. Regular expressions are trivial. The regular expressions themselves are just the same in Python and Perl, but it's all built into the programming language rather than having to uh, import different modules to do that. Calling external programs is completely trivial. All you have to do if you want to run another program and get the results back is to put the name of the program in backticks. In other words, open single inverted commas. Perl can be set to force you to declare each variable that you use. And this really helps avoid errors from spelling mistakes. It's all too easy to misname a variable and in Python, you wouldn't know. It's simply uh, a new variable name. So you could be using count in one place and uh, cnt in another place. Uh, and uh, Python wouldn't let you know. Perl would. Perl is a stable language. Code that was written many, many years ago will still run. Whereas, of course, the big change from Python 2 to Python 3 means that's not the case. And I often find when I'm trying to run older pieces of Python, even with the right Python version, it still won't run properly. Python can be confusing. How do you know if something is an iterator? In other words, whether you can just step through it by saying for A in B. Do you know if B is an iterator or not? And finally, I like curly brackets. Rather than using tabs to set up blocks of code, in Perl, like many other languages, you use curly brackets. And when you're editing code, adding in another condition or something like that, it's so much easier to have the curly brackets in place. I accept that Python is the language of the moment. It is the most preferred language, and it does have these wonderful libraries that let you do all sorts of useful things. So in Perl, when we have a variable, a scalar variable that just stores a number, we put a dollar in front of it. So dollar $A equals 5. Say so dollar $A equals dollar $A plus 1. So A would now be 6. Print $A. This is another slight difference that um, the default printing in Python always appends a new line. It doesn't in Perl, so we need to put in the backslash N to say we want a new line. And here we've got $B equals hello world, uh, so that's setting up a string. So again, a string is a scalar variable, it contains one string of characters. Lists or arrays or vectors, depending how you want to look at them, are referred to using an at sign. So here we're saying at position equals 5.4, 2.7, 9.5. These might be x, y, z coordinates. And if we wanted to print one of these, then we number our lists just as we do in Python from zero. So this would be position zero, position one, position two. Now when we print position one, so this would be 2.7, because we're only referring to a single item, not to the whole list, we now use a dollar instead of an at. So print dollar position one backslash n would print 2.7. And we can update a particular position uh, or a particular item in the position array or list by saying dollar position two, that's this one, equals 3.6. So that would change our 9.5 to 3.6. Now we also have what in Python is called a dictionary, but in Perl is called a hash. Now we can refer to a whole hash using a percent sign. So percent position would be the whole of the position hash. Just as in Python, we refer to particular items 
with a string. So position x equals 5.4, position y equals 2.7, position z equals 9.5. We have control statements just as we do in Python and the first of these is the if statement. So here we're setting the scalar variable x to minus 6. Then we're saying if x is greater than 0, then we start a block of code with a curly bracket, print positive, and we end the block. Then we say else if x is equal to 0, start a block, print 0. Else, print negative. Now notice each of the actual commands where we're doing something rather than considering uh, a condition uh, are ended with a semicolon. That's another difference from Python. And we have these different comparators which are different for numbers or strings. So when you compare strings you're just comparing them uh, alphabetically. So we can say less than or LT for a string, less than or equal to, LE. Equal to, it's a double equals sign. So a single equals sign is assignment, a double equals sign is a comparator. So that's EQ for strings, greater than or equal to, greater than and not equal to. The next type of control statement is a while statement. So here we're setting x to 5 and saying while x is greater than 0, begin a block, print x, and then set x to x minus 1. So this will print 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now we have a for each and a for statement. So similar things of course exist in Python but let's go through how we can use these here because the for statement is a little bit different. So here we're creating an array or list uh, called x containing the values 100, 200, 300. And we can do for each dollar $i in at x print i. So that will simply take each of the values in turn from the array and it will print 100, 200, 300. The second way of producing a loop using for each or for is the for statement where we're saying we have a starting condition, we have a while condition and we have something to be done for each iteration. So in this case we're starting off by setting $i to naught and then we're saying while dollar i is less than 100, do what's in this block and in, at the end of the block increment i. So this will produce the values 0 through to 99 and print them. The third example kind of combines the two approaches. So we're taking an array called x with the values 100, 200, 300 and then instead of using the for each loop to loop through each item we're using a for loop to loop through from 0 to less than 3. So 0, 1 and 2 that's position 0, 1, 2 in the array and we're incrementing the value of i at each step. So the print statement then becomes $x, remembering we're referring to one item in the array, so it's dollar rather than at, square brackets, $i. So this will be value 0, value 1, value 2. Now the reason that you might want to do this rather than doing the for each is because now we know where we are in this particular array or list. If we had multiple arrays, then we could refer to the same position in those different arrays all at the same time. Now, here's a simple Perl example, which I think I showed you in the previous lecture, where we're wanting to extract the first column from this data file and the third column. 
all we need to do in Perl is these five lines of code. We say while less than greater than and that means read from a file either the file specified on the command line or from standard input which could be the output of another program. And what we're going to do on each line in turn is split the line into columns and we do that using the split function and then we're going to print column 1 and column 3 and return character. So the output from this would look like this. Now coming back to our flowchart for counting the number of C alphas in a protein databank file, how would we implement this in Perl? Well here we go, this is all we need. We say AA count, amino acid count, or res count, or whatever we want to call it, equals zero. While there is something in the file, we're reading a line at a time. We say at columns equals split, and we're interested in columns two. Remember, it's the third column in the file that contains the atom type. So if columns two equals C alpha, then we increment the amino acid count. And we loop round until we end the file, at which stage we say print, there were $AA count amino acids. In summary then, for this lecture we've looked at concepts of programming and language types, we've looked at some example languages, uh, we've looked at SQL, a language for querying databases, we've looked at algorithms, flowcharts and pseudocode, we've introduced a few key concepts in Perl and how to implement an algorithm to count the number of amino acids in a PDB file. Uh, we've taken the algorithm for that and we've implemented it in Perl. And in the practical session you'll try some Perl exercises including doing exactly that sort of thing, counting the number of amino acids in a file.